Welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs mini podcast. These short podcasts are meant to supplement the full length episodes that I do along with Jess Terrell and Scott Stewart, in which we usually talk about one of Burroughs' novels in detail. Right now, we're using the mini podcast to do a chapter by chapter analysis of the 1912 novel Tarzan of the Apes. My name is Tim DeForest. Uh, I'm the author of several books about subjects such as uh, pulp magazines and old time radio. And I uh, keep a blog about such matters at comics, old time radio, and other cool stuff. Now, today we're talking about chapter 26 of Tarzan of the Apes, titled The Height of Civilization. Now, please note that I will be including uh, spoilers. In both about the uh, the novel Tarzan of the Apes and sometimes later novels in the series. And also, I would recommend that you re-listen or re read rather this particular chapter before listening to the podcast, as I will be assuming you're familiar with the events in it as I discuss them. Now, there is a lot of nice touches in this chapter that reinforce Tarzan's characterization and advance the plot. Uh, the most important these of these can be seen in the following quote. Quote, Tarzan had no sooner entered the jungle. This, by the way, is taking place when he has uh, taken a bet that he can hunt a lion armed with just uh, his rope and his knife. Quote, had Tar Tarzan had no, no sooner entered the jungle than he took to the trees, and it was with a feeling of an exultant freedom that he swung once more through the forest branches. This was the life, that how he loved it. Civilization held nothing like this in its narrow and circumscribed, circumscribed sphere, hemmed in by restrictions and conventionalities. Even clothes were a hindrance and a nuisance. At last he was free. He had not realized what a prisoner he had been there. How easy it would be to circle back to the coast and then make towards the south in his own jungle and cabin. Unquote. And then a few minutes later, when he killed the lion he's hunting, quote, for a moment, Tarzan stood irresolute, swayed by the conflicting emotions of loyalty to Darnot and a mighty lust for the freedom of his own jungle. At last, the vision of a beautiful face and a memory of worn lips, warm lips crushed to his dissolved, uh, 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 warm lips crushed to his, dissolved the fascinating picture that he had been drawing of his old life. So it's his love for Jane that allows him to resist the temptation to return to the jungle. But it's interesting to think about what he would have done in the long term had Jane not been a factor. We've seen in earlier chapters that he was growing dissatisfied with life among the apes even before he saw Jane, that his active intelligence was yearning for a level of conversation and exchange of ideas that he didn't, that he didn't himself even fully comprehend at that point. Would he have been happy in the jungle? In the direct sequel, The Return of Tarzan, when he believes he's lost his chance with Jane, he does return to the jungle, but he soon becomes a part of the Wazari tribe, thus showing he didn't want to lose the chance to interact with other human beings. In the seventh novel, Tarzan the Untamed, Burroughs decided to kill off Jane to free Tarzan up to have adventures, but his editors made him change this and keep Jane alive. Nonetheless, many of the later novels uh, have, have Tarzan stumbling into a new adventures while hanging out in the jungle with uh, nobody other than perhaps Nikima the monkey or Tantor the elephant. But Jane and friends like Darno, uh, Jane and friends like Darno were always there when he went home. Tarzan's tempted to return to the jungle in this chapter, but I don't think it ever would have stuck, not completely. Another important thing to note uh, in this chapter includes Tarzan's initial shyness with the, when approaching civilization. I think another nice bit of uh, characterization. My wife, uh, Angela, thinks that Tarzan's ensuing transformation into a polished gentleman is awfully fast, but she concedes that no one uh, wants to read a lengthy passage in which Darnot teaches the ape man, uh, you, know, you know, how to deport himself, which spoon to use, which fork to use, all that stuff. Later, when Tarzan is talking about hunting lions with some Frenchmen, he states that each lion is different in personality, and you couldn't judge them all based on the behavior of one, just as you couldn't judge all black men or white men on the basis of one bad example. I think it has to be said here that Tarzan is showing a little bit of hypocrisy, since he's still judging black men based on his experience with the cannibal tribe. In the commentary from the last chapter, we talk about the epiphany he has 
regarding this in The Return of Tarzan, perhaps his most important moment of moral growth, when he, real, when he does realize he must judge all men as individuals. But at this moment, in this chapter, he's not yet living up to that, the ideal he's espousing. He'll get there, though. Other than his temptation to return to the jungle, the most important event in this is the stop in Paris to have his fingerprints taken. Burroughs draws out the suspense here by having the police chief decide to bring in an expert. Obviously, Burroughs wanted to save the confirmation of the identity of Tarzan's parents for the last chapter. Now, I mentioned in the, in the last podcast that I was uncertain how much knowledge of fingerprints were in the public consciousness when this was published in 1912. It is interesting to note that by having the police chief explain how fingerprints work to Tarzan, he's also explaining it to us. Burroughs obviously, and probably correctly, thought that a fair number of his readers needed to be told how fingerprints worked. Now that's it for this time. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, please visit my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and Other Cool Stuff, where you can also find a link to my Amazon.com author page, uh, buy my books and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. Uh, please keep an ear out for further podcasts, both these mini podcasts and the full length ones that I do with Jess and Scott. Um, and I do appreciate your listening to these. If you're enjoying what we're doing on these podcasts, we would appreciate it if you take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. But in either case, uh, thank you for listening and we will be back soon.